If you're trying to learn a language right now, listen up. Conversation that I had with linguist and author Ekaterina Mativa could jack up your efficiency by an order of magnitude. Now, Kate is a freaking language learning legend. She's written a book, she's various master's degrees, she's been a professor of communications at the University of Palermo, and she is the founder and CEO of Amo Lingua, which is a leading language learning course provider for companies and organizations whose employees really need to learn how to communicate. Kate and I go deep here. We talk about cultural intelligence, we talk about your language alter ego, and we talk about how your approach to studying a language could mean the difference between being actually conversational and just being a Duolingo robot. So combined with using Brainscape to study your language using spaced repetition, I hope that Kate's tips here help you achieve fluency in a dramatically shorter amount of time. Enjoy the conversation. So Ekaterina or Kate, and maybe you could tell us uh, why you go by Kate. Uh, you've been a linguist and a teacher for many years. Uh, what have you kind of started focusing most on uh, based on your experience? And what does your company Amolingua focus on? Well. Andrea or Andrea or Andrea. Yeah, indeed. So you're right, I'm a linguist. So I've been teaching languages and cultures for over 15 years. I'm not that old. It's just I started early. And, uh, you know, um, the more you teach, the more you see, right? Like how uh, people start focusing on specific, um, let's say, like learning path. And there are lots of struggles, a lot of traumas coming in from school, right? Like school or university, because, well, maybe in your years as well, you had a situation when uh, um, maybe a teacher was yelling at you or just focusing on grammar and still expecting you uh, somehow magically speak. And then uh, miraculously, you would remember a couple of phrases and you would save yourself. Yeah, the exam. Everything happened, right? And there. Uh, what I notice is that yeah, a lot of people, especially here, like our adults or students who are also like in their twenties, coming to us and saying, "Oh, you know, I learned for a few years, but I can't speak, or I just don't understand, or like, oh, I speak, but I actually don't get them, or I don't get their mindset." And um, with this and with Amolingua, which means I love language, I started focusing more and more on communicative approach, and their communicative approach meaning that you first speak. Right. And then you focus on grammar and all the rest. And it's not just like, oh, yeah, let's learn vocabulary. No, let's just like have a conversation. Let's see what you can say with your current vocabulary. And even if you make mistakes, it's OK, because uh, it's natural. It's language. And when we were babies, we were also learning our first language or languages. And uh, we were making mistakes and nobody made fun of us. Right. But there, right now there is a tendency. Oh, you made a mistake. You're learning a second language. No, it's a disaster. No, no. So, yeah. So we're going beyond communicative approach. And we start focusing uh, not only like on vocabulary, grammar, we're also like paying attention to pronunciation and the emotions in that language. And then also to cultural context. Like uh, if you're going to learn English with a K, it will be different from the English for US, but not only because of, let's say, uh, different grammar rules, um, vocabulary, but also because of different sociocultural context. Same about Spanish. If you're learning Spanish for Spain, it's one thing. And then when you're learning Spanish for Latin America, it's a completely different best. And then you need to choose from which country and whether there is neutral Spanish. So we've been focusing a lot on these intricacies. And when we uh, started, like when we started, let's say, working more and more with adults who are entrepreneurs, we realized that when they were lacking actually more social skills, like soft skills in those languages, because let's say you achieved a very good level of Spanish and you can speak, but you sound like a robot in a way. And it's not only like maybe phonetics, not where, but it's just um, maybe you took monotonous speech from English and just you put it into Spanish and uh, you just don't know how to communicate with Spanish speaking people to connect and then to impress them and maybe to sell something to them, to pitch to them. So we started focusing as well on this and uh, it's out to be great because it actually changes their process of well, work in international teams, with international clients, and you know, the way how you're perceived in another language. And with all of this, it's like all coming down to my own research, like a linguist or language alter ego. And yeah, that's kind of yeah, the scope. So you put people in an environment where they have kind of a, a topic of conversation or, or a need, and that, that forces them to, to want to communicate 
and not necessarily care about the grammar or vocab, but really get their point across. And that motivation uh, helps to sort of juice the the learning. Is that uh, did I play it back correctly? Yeah, exactly. This is like the start, I would say. And then obviously there are certain materials, texts, audios, um relevant yet to their topic of interest. Because, well, let's say like as soon as you start a conversation about something that you love, you really love and you are ready to talk about it for hours and hours, mm -hmm. no language barrier will stop you. Because you will try to convey your thoughts, your ideas, what you really like. Mm -hmm. It's almost the opposite of the order of operations that they teach in school, like you were saying, right? You, oh, you spelled this wrong. You know, we have to keep focusing on this one word or this one conjugation until you're getting it perfectly before you can move on. And, um, you know, really kind of starting with the need. I think there's a phrase, something like necessity is the mother of learning. Uh, and I think it, it really is true uh, with what you're doing and, and motivation. Um, one of the, the things that I think I've heard you say in, in other talks uh, mm -hmm. is that, you know, when you're speaking a different language, you have sort of a language alter ego. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what that means and, and what role the language alter ego plays in language learning? This is still, you know, some fan of like of many debates. It's like a topic of many debates in a way that a few years ago, more than a decade ago, when I presented it at one of the universities and conference, I was called crazy. I was called crazy because there was teachers, there are like uh, doctors, not who were like uh, listening to me. So, like, how do you imagine us um, providing the knowledge of everyday life, or mindset of these people that are language, like here in the classroom? How can we do that if we don't live there or we've never been there? And I'm like, excuse me, excuse me, sorry. Um, how can you teach high level, like, of, uh, any language if you've never been there? Like, if you just uh, learned it inside uh, well, school, university, like formal learning. It's impossible because it means that you don't know how to communicate in a certain way, like to convey the mindset, indeed their, let's say, sociocultural connotation, as I call it. So when you come back to uh, language over eager, um, what helps, uh, indeed, it's mimicking. So with my well, training at art school like, uh, back in teenage years, I noticed that you, when you want to take a certain part, like in the playing theater. You just go and observe people. You study them, how they move, how they say certain things, like not like what they say, but like actually how. Um, let's say uh, how they order breakfast, how they walk a dog. And then you try to mimic it and see what it would be you if you were in that position. And uh, when I still said really diving into languages, I did that. So when I went, for instance, to study like uh, Spanish, Salamanca, I already had a very solid B1, meaning intermediate level. I came there and I just sat in a cafe and I observed. And then I became Catarina de Salamanca because I just realized that I can be local. So people would take me either local or person from, let's say, different province. Yeah, when there's like a shift in accent. And the same thing happened with Italian and other languages. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it requires you to be exactly like a local because like some formal institutions say, okay, you must sound like native, like 100%. But excuse me, we have there's so many dialects. We have so many different differentiations that maybe if they say that it's a mistake, it's actually not a mistake that you're making. Maybe it's just a different dialect. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's, that's the beauty about it. So with language alter ego, eventually it's about creating a different set of behaviors, certain actions, reactions, because our emotional reactions mm, are registered slightly differently across cultures. So if we are with you in UK and we're talking with you about, I don't know, a cup of tea and you know <laughs> that your cup is empty, I'm like, oh, of course I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but I would be like, you know, very reserved in my reactions. So is it almost like a, a multiple personality? Like when you're Caterina de Salamanca, do you feel like you you think differently and you behave differently, not only, you know, speaking, but actually That's feeling? That's a debate. That's the debate of what's going on. I would say that it's like sub-personalities, right? So that you have your core, you have your center, but then you have all these different facets and you change them based on sociocultural context. Because if you, if you stay 
an English, you know, reserved person, just, you know, being a bit of snobbish, you know, I don't want to go into, you know, I don't want to go into stereotypes, but I started in St. Andrews, and St. Andrews is like, you know, William and Kate and all, so St. Andrews is like Oxford, Cambridge, St. Andrews, so I know when I, you know, become an arrogant, like, in certain circles, but if you stay on this reserve, you know, you won't be able to connect with like Spanish-speaking people, Italian-speaking people, because you need to be warmer, you need to be more open, you need to be more extroverted. So when you change the space, you adjust. Mm -hmm. I would say it's about adaptation. It's about flexible, kind of flexible mindset in a way, because there is like rigid mindset when people, even when they learn a language, they stay as they are, they move to another country and they still stay as they are, like an engineer. This is me, right? But those who have flexible mindset and they learn how to adapt, so they develop the ability, they can switch this faces over these facets. So I would say that it's not like, oh my God, like a multiple or personality disorder, <laughs> nothing like that. No, but true, because, you know, like there's like Billy Milligan and all this, like, you know, split, like movie. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's scary. And back in time, bilingual people were also diagnosed with that, even though, like, you know, there's multiple personality disorder, even though everything was fine with them. They just um, ex um, expressed emotions in different way when they were switching languages. So I would say I definitely express emotions differently. I may feel different intensity of my emotions in different languages. Uh, about thoughts, I would say I'm influenced by the sociocultural situation that's happening in that particular country or culture where I am. Mm -hmm. And there, I would say the decision making, um, well, it's interesting, as I say, it's part of the debate. I'm still you know, investigating it, but I noticed that it depends a lot on, again, the environment. And there, some of that actually depends on grammar. That's interesting because uh, there have been a few studies on grammar, the way how we put prepositions, how we talk about time, space, that can influence our perception of reality. Of course, our perception of reality is like individual and time indeed goes from, you know, back to, like forward. But if you talk like culturally speaking, time can be, you know, circular, just going around and around and you can think about, you know, how good is there. Um, and then in some cultures, time, but it's like more tribal ones. Time actually goes backwards. So mm -hmm. you see the past in front of you and the, the future is behind. Why? Because the past, like you've seen the past, that's why it's in front of you. That's fascinating. I think, you know, I, I've heard certain languages where the words for now or soon are a little bit fuzzier or like an imperfect translation to, you know, English or German or something like that. And those cultures tend to be very late for things or not, you know, respectful of, of punctuality. And they, they maybe tie it back to the language or, or even, you know, there's certain, certain tribes that they find that, you know, they don't have a word for blue because blue doesn't naturally occur in, in nature, or at least, you know, in, in the places where they live. Uh, and because of that, when they're shown, you know, pieces of paper with drawings on it that have blue, they actually don't distinguish blue. Blue to them just looks like gray. And they say it's not necessarily their, their retina, but maybe they just never learned the word for blue. And so they, they then, you know, perceive the world differently. So it's, it's such a fascinating topic. Um, one of the things when you were just talking about your, your time, you know, in Spain, um, was you mentioned you were, you were already about a B1 level. Um, when you sort of developed this alter ego, you know, Caterina de Salamanca. Um, did you need to have already been, you know, pretty conversant, like around a, a, a A2 or B1 in order to really start um, understanding cultural intelligence? Or could somebody who's even a, a pure beginner um, start to, to begin to, to get culturally intelligent even from the start? I had this debate because like for me it happened in different ways, but I also wanted to know how it happens to other people, especially if let's say you don't speak quite fluent a language, maybe you don't speak that language, but you need the culture. And a few years ago, I had a very interesting conversation with a Buddhist monk, Mathieu Ricard. And Mathieu Ricard is a French sociologist, but uh, many years ago, a few decades ago, he actually went uh, um, to, uh, well, to convert here into a Buddhist monk. So, um, he spent all this time in Tibet, but when he came there, he didn't speak Tibetan language, and it's one of the hardest languages, because it's one of the oldest languages. And uh, we talked about it in the culture, and it turned out that he was adjusting, while, while he was very slow learning the language, he was adjusting to the culture, he was adjusting to the routine, like everyday life, learning their customs, their habits, and that helped him a lot with the language. So it also can be vice versa, yeah, the other way around. 
And if, for instance, you're just fast learning a language and you surround yourself uh, with everything from that culture, like uh, like it was, it was Italian for me, like Italian, I think culture came first in the language because I eventually I learned Italian on my own up to B2 and then I went to Italy to upgrade. But um, why? Because I had this immense love for Italian since my childhood because my parents showed to me Italian movies and they were dots so I could actually hear Italian speak and like, you know, the word stronzo. Sorry, like we won't translate it because of the inappropriate and Italian people know what it is. But like I was watching a lot of movies with Adriana Cirentano and then Nini and the, I was learning about the culture. Like I was learning how it is, at least the, how it was, you know, back in the third century. And it was much easier for me as well to adapt to the Italian way of living um, and learning the language because you already have this, right? You are introduced to the culture. So if you start watching movies or listen to radio, uh, read their magazines like online editions, or maybe follow certain influences from that country, from that culture, right? Um, read history, of course. Mm -hmm. um, that will already help you, and then you you need always like have a look. It, it may be a bit stereotypical, but you need to have a look at what's the most important for the culture. Like for instance, Brazil. We can talk about football, like Argentina, Argentina, Brazil. You know, like football. Mm -hmm. But Brazil, surfing is a big thing. Of course, we're talking about uh, like coastal cities, mm -hmm. but surfing is a big thing, and there are a lot of uh, phrases connected here to surfing, uh, stories, uh, historical events. So. It's good when you pick up Brazilian Portuguese, mm -hmm. actually dive into that. Like I also like when I was learning, like I learned Portuguese, like Portugal, but then I was learning Brazilian Portuguese and I need to switch. I connected where it's surfing or like mm -hmm. uh, France, how you can connect with French. What would it be for you? Was it more? Was it literature? Was it cuisine? Yeah, it, it points you toward the the type of vocabulary that, that really matters for that language, too. Like you wouldn't maybe mm -hmm. necessarily have to learn so much surfing vocabulary in landlocked. Bolivia, uh, or something like yeah. that. So yeah, that's, uh, that's super interesting. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, reading, reading news and watching movies and, and, um, those kind of things. Um, typically you need some kind of, you know, underlying background in language or otherwise just it, it's, it's all over your head. Um, and I do understand that on Molingua, you, you teach both beginners and advanced, um, students. Um, how would you take, you know, if, if it's a, a specialist class, like, um, you know, negotiation skills in Italian, or, you know, we just worked together on, on adaptive flashcards to complement your medical Spanish mm -hmm. class. Does somebody in your medical Spanish class already have to be, you know, a pretty advanced Spanish speaker, or are you able to accommodate people from the beginning stages? For theirs, typically, especially for beginners, well, I write my books. <laughs> and that's also, you know, funny because, yeah, I write like in different languages. Um, well, like English speaking people, Spanish speaking, and then again, like they're, they are like three books right now. But the point is that what I try to explain always that you can start on your own and you can use all these wonderful apps and tools and like Brainscape here with flashcards and like starting, you know, with like uh, A1. Why not? Just like just picking up, just playing around. Um, and then um, when you want to learn language here for a specific profession, what you can do, you can focus first on general language. That's what we do, for instance, with our courses for IT people or like entrepreneurs as well, like, yeah, medical like uh, professionals. So what we do, we help them to go from like A1, A2, nobody is zero. Everyone is always A1 and A2, especially like, like related languages that are up to be one. Mm -hmm. And then we just help them to go for general training. So they start speaking, they have everyday vocabulary. And from simple conversation, they can go into a deeper conversation. And from there, when you're already B1, B2, so it's like in the media, upper intermediate, you are free to go to any specialization. Mm -hmm. so basically just to get the, the basics, go up there and then go and focus on your profession. Now, okay, so the basic levels are more generalist, but then you you do help them specialize relatively early. I mean, B1 is, you know, relatively early. Yeah. But that, that also, you know, it gives you an interesting lens uh, through which to, to see the, the language mm -hmm. that's going to be important to you. You know, if I'm a business mm -hmm. person versus if I'm in the arts, um, I might need mm -hmm. a totally different set of vocabulary. You know, I, I uh, find myself relatively conversational in, in Spanish and I spent a couple of years of my life, you know, living in Spanish speaking countries. And then I found myself, um, you know, helping somebody, uh, fix up a kitchen and, you know, they had all these tools and everything and they were saying, Oh, can you grab me the, this, and can I have that? And I had no idea what they were talking about. Cause I realized that, you know, my Spanish, uh, was sort of like professional Spanish and business Spanish and, you know, all these other, uh, scenarios. So, you know, there are, there are probably people 
who start in like a restaurant or something like that, um, super, super early, like kind of, you know, caveman Spanish, but who probably knew those words better than I did. Um, so it really matters, you know, what your lens is um, that you're starting. And and on that line, you know, you, you also might be exposed to so many different flavors of the language dialect wise, um, you know, particularly Spanish, you know, stay on this example. I know you're familiar with it. You guys do a lot with Spanish with, with Amolingua. Um, what type of exercises do you guys do in your in your courses to make sure that that your students have both the the breadth of exposure to different dialects, right? Because you never know who you're going to meet or what you're going to see on TV. But then also the the specialized training in the dialect that they probably care most about because they're in that country or, or learning. So how do you draw that line? So yeah, pronunciation is a big topic, and we know that uh, more and more people now, especially as well like on stage, yeah, come out and they they have an accent and they may have a strong accent. Um, back in time in formal education. I was scared to death to like speak with strong accent or whatever, whichever language. Um, but what helped me eventually, first of all, to relax. <laughs> like nobody was, was going, you know, to beat me. Because like, yeah, phonetics, like back in time, I was like, I was so anxious at like uh, exercises, sessions, that I was always overdoing it. Um, but eventually, like I figured it out because yeah, I met other you know professors, teachers, and again theater, and you have so many different techniques. And uh, for instance, a lot of people when they try to attack pronunciation, they think that they just need to listen and repeat. And we see it. I don't know, like movies, Mister Bean, Love Actually, and all like it's like listen and repeat, listen and repeat. Yes and no, because if okay, if you have a musically, if you practice music, maybe. But if you don't. How would you do it? Like you would sound like <laughs> out of tune. <laughs> so what you need to do, you need to start with your muscles for any language, because when we are born, we are babies, we can pronounce any sound. That's true. That's like scientifically proven. But what happens that when you grow up and let's say you start picking up language or languages that your parents are speaking, you start training those muscles for that specific language language. That's why they're saying that when you're learning a language up to like seven years old or so, you will actually be able to speak without an accent. It yeah. also connects it to the brain, it's neuroscience, it's a very broker area there, but it's indeed about the how you train your muscles. So when you grow up and like like us, like grown ups trying to learn a new language, we start using the same muscles we use for our languages to learn a new one to speak it. And of course, there will be an accent. So what do you need to do? You need to start training other muscles. It's like an entry. And there's a set of techniques, specific exercises that you can engage those muscles that were probably, you know, not very active during your entire life, but then it will help you to get to the stage, listen and repeat, because what you're going to repeat will coincide with what you hear. And then of course, it's about uh, tones, you know, bananas, tones, yeah. Yeah, um, and the are on the page, but like first, it's about the other sounds, how you can get it, and then of course, it's different about conveying emotion, because as you know, if uh, let's say like a less American person was speaking English, or this person can sound you know rude, the same like yeah, but like German, how we like we hear oh German is like so aggressive, but they are like just talking about I don't know flowers, so <laughs> that's that's kind of thing that we need to take into account uh, emotions, how we convey them. And whether we need, as we we're saying, be more reserved, like reserved, right, or more open. And from there, we practice uh, with like phrases, right, examples. And then we get into specific, let's say, like dialect. Because uh, eventually, if you're focused in one country, okay, you will pick up that particular country, like I mentioned here. But if you're going to be everywhere, what what could work? Uh, you can mix accents, or you can just uh, pick up a neutral one. Mm. And that's it. But um, yeah, you can you can always like choose. Okay, Spanish from Spain, uh, then you will sound yeah like from Spain yeah for Latin America. Or you can pick up yeah Mexican, so you will sound like Mexican. <laughs> well, so what are those the, those exercises then? You said you can you know train the the muscles. Is it you're just sitting there with kind of a linguistic coach who's making you do yeah. certain things with your mouth? Or are they describing to you you know with words engage this part of your mouth and these types of muscles? You know how do you how do you train yeah. people in those ways? So we have a couple of video courses with uh, two recorded exercises and audios. And then, of course, here, if you take sessions yeah, with a coach, the coach gives you your phrases. And there, as you know, like I can give you as well example, like with English, because there's so many international yeah, people who always try to get our accents or 
the thing is like if you manage to say a looks good side it's one of the phrases that you really like you know uh, manage to save your lips then you start speaking because a lot of people yeah use their lips yeah and not the languages mm -hmm. while in uh for instance in for spanish um uh like for english-speaking people it's very difficult to say the word um right better like so burro like for instance right so yeah so when 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 you start and then it's uh, about palatal palatal uh, uh because you have lots of aspiration all and in spanish you don't have aspiration yeah so mm -hmm. if you put it oh yeah mm -hmm. uh so with butter 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 uh, so mm -hmm. there you can actually start guessing t and r in like normal spanish way in a way yeah because mm -hmm. r yeah r is not in english at all like r it doesn't exist it's right like, oh. yeah you just gotta sit there and do the exercises um and i mean sometimes vowels in certain languages like i was i was learning french and i had a really hard time you know just the letter u in french uh it's a very specific kind of like curt sound that you know i would just say ooh like I have my lazy american uh, mm -hmm. voice and i never really got it well and then i was just recently reading the book fluent forever by uh, gabriel mm -hmm. weiner which has a lot mm -hmm. of good points, a lot of things maybe yeah, I don't yeah. you nice. about, um, that I, I challenge. But he, he had this exercise where to say that sound, mm -hmm. um, you put your mouth like you're saying, you know, ooh, yeah. like that. But while your mouth is like that, try to say the English vowel E. So you do this and you go E. And that actually is the way you would say it in French. So like so many of these foreign sounds, you actually can sort of describe to somebody, like try to make this English American sound, but while your mouth is doing this, and then, yes. just, then it's muscle memory, and then you just got to do that a million times. Exactly, yeah. but like muscle memory, so you need to prepare the muscles, and then you got your muscle memory. And yeah, like for French, typically it's like chicken butt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do, you do. So like, because again, like for French, we need to put your lips in mm -hmm. more like that position. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then from there, you're so used to talking because you, well, oh, you can, you can probably to, to, to me right now that um, uh, French is quite hard, but you know, so you see like extras coming from this, exactly from ourselves. Yeah, yeah totally. Well, I'm, I'm guessing that probably some of uh, our audience who is listening to this conversation, speaking of accents and dialects, might be wondering uh, where your accent comes from. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the first person to tell you you have an interesting accent i know english is your like, first language but it seems like it might have had uh, many different influences uh how did like, how did the uh accent of ekaterina come to be yeah it's uh, it's quite an interesting you know story because uh, my accent shift so if you stay too much time in us or i start you know speaking more friendly and actually maybe like our for texas or whatever it is like they're like different <laughs> accents if I stay too much time in UK, so I'm going, you know, proper, proper, proper. And if I'm, you know, somewhere around push, you know, really push and do so it's all like I'm there. And then I would say that it's uh, just because of so many languages in your under then as I talk too much to international people who don't like that much, the like close, you know, dick English, because mm -hmm. they start asking like, oh, can European know? So I try to soft british and mix it between british and american so that um people can understand me especially when you talk about your teaching so you want uh, uh to be understood as well by the teachers or by the students yeah the teacher so yeah i would say that it's a mix of uh, many different languages coming there many different sounds and dialects of english because i've had so many dialects of english of all these years and yeah, like I would say that English is one of my first languages, right? And the end uh, right now, yeah, same, like it's a limited position because now it's like English, Spanish, Portuguese, then there is also like Russian, Italian, and then you go down there going like about French, German, Polish, and then yeah, Mandarin, like uh, right now I'm more like in the attrition phase in Mandarin, but like whenever I need it, I can come back to it. So it's uh, yeah, you've one of the points. You've trained your ear, you trained your mouth, and like, you know, a lot of these, it, it's like riding a bike. And, you know, it sounds like you were fortunate enough early in life to have exposure to a lot of languages. Uh, many of us uh, don't, particularly in America, we're super sheltered. Um, but, you know, wherever the person is coming from, for a new language learner um, who is starting as a relative beginner, but really is autodidactic, really motivated, really wants to, to get better at a, a language, um, other than obviously taking the, the Homolingua course, uh, and obviously other than using Brainscape and uh, either finding our great adaptive flashcards or making your own, um, what uh, are your favorite tools that a language learner should should use uh, to really help them practice and uh, and just become 
you know, more comfortable with the language. When I was just starting to the Malingua, when the Malingua wasn't the Malingua, it was still uh, Europe Online. And there, it's like our test year when we accidentally got into top 20 startups of the world. <laughs> NBC startup open and everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. It was just like, it was like ages ago, really, we were there. But um, back in time, I was looking actually for a partner who could be for us like brainscape now because uh back then your yeah, was memorized and they're uh, at cook her kind of opened the door for me for like memory uh like for memory championships and all but um there wasn't this option for creating courses like like we do right now with you guys and after that i didn't see it like of course like i saw uh, Derlingo doing like great stuff but like i mean i think Derlingo is cool like when you play around I, especially in early versions, I didn't see much of this um, scientific base in a way. That's all like when we compare. But then, of course, our, I would say that, yeah, we definitely do a, a space repetition. We recommend a space repetition. Um, and it can be done, you know, in different ways. Like your ways, like flashcards, um, mind maps are great. So when, like, there's different tools for mind maps. And you, you just Google and you go for mind maps. So what you can do, you can pick a specific topic and language. And then you can add vocabulary. And then you create a story. So then you create the associations, and this actually helps you to memorize that particular vocabulary because you know when you learn just like words without context, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't uh, doesn't get stuck, right? So uh, well, it doesn't stick with you. So like what happened that if you learn phrases in the context, let's say storytelling, uh, when you need this phrase, yeah, it it actually pops out, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course when we talk with you about well English speaking people. For learning Romance languages, the beginning say could be Germanic. Just take comparative tables um, and like have a look. How, for instance, you know, yeah, Spanish. So how have, have a look like what it is in English and what it is in Spanish, because eventually what you will notice is that the other language, especially the European one, very similar to yours. Why? Because same roots. And when you start looking at the roots, so you can actually hear well see oh um like uh revolution revolution right information and formation so you just what you just need to do again like google there's so many materials that just show to you uh same or well parts of words that change here yeah, in other language depending on language and with this information with these basics you can go around already like knowing your words that actually are related to the word in that language and yeah, start building sentences so yeah, so for us, I would say this, and then of course, um, there are like different plugins on uh, Google that you can use uh, for videos, like YouTube videos. Um, there is one, I need to have a chance the name of it, but it's really cool one, um, Revolution Translate or something. I, I need to, like, I need to share this with you. We can uh, like even like find it for like for YouTube for the link. But the, the cool part is it's it's for free. You just uh, install it and then you can watch whatever video in uh, uh, like um, in original language and then see subtitles and subtitles are generated by uh, AI which is subtitles great. Subtitles in English not necessarily in not you can, okay. you can choose you can, you can choose the language it could be even like Japanese even if oh, it's that. like uh, yeah it seems like it's Spanish. It's amazing. And I see that why don't I remember because there are more and more and more of these apps appearing right now because of AI. And it's really cool because AI eventually helps you. It's not going to you know, completely substitute a teacher or a current tool, but it helps you and it can help teachers, um, well, to, to train you. You you can't use AI, let's say, as a partner in conversation because it's not at the level yet to convey all the intricacies of the human communication, right? Mm -hmm. You can just maybe practice for your exam, like writing now and now maybe like completing tasks and AI can give you maybe explanation, right? Like grammar explanation, vocabulary, right answers. But uh, if you want to use it for any kind of practice, I think it's great. For any kind of text to speech, uh, subtitles, great. great. Yeah, you don't always yeah. have a teacher sitting right next to you um, or, or yeah. can afford that number of hours. So, you know, Absolutely. the more that, that these tools yeah. can help, help substitute. And at the end of the day, you can have an AI chatbot, and some of them are getting okay, but um, it, it's not as motivating as talking to a human because you're not talking to a human, you know. Uh, you know, the, yeah, exactly. The, yeah. the relationship. Cool. So yeah, reading, um, having, uh, having kind of like audio um, translation. It sounds like you're you're not philosophically opposed 
to translation, which which I, I like to hear. You know, there are some language purists, uh, particularly that book I was just referring to. I just finished, uh, you know, Fluent Forever. Uh, that are so anti-translation. Like you can have just no English. You got to learn it like your first language. Um, but I, my first language was English, and I wasn't sp speaking fluent English until I was like five or six years old, probably. Right? Good conversation. So I would like to learn my second language faster. And I have, I have a tool called English that is already a baseline from which I could jump off. So yeah, the translation of YouTube videos I think is a great thing. And then eventually, you know, you you graduate to having the subtitles be in the same language you, you're just you're just sort of reading what was spoken and really continuing to train your your eye and ear so i love those those types of exercises um what else should our audience know about amolingua you know how what should they look for on your site um, how can they find all the the latest and greatest stuff that you've produced your book everything tell tell us um what uh, what, what your closing thoughts are i will add something after what you just said about exposure very important it's about exposure, like when you're exposed to a certain language. So if you can surround yourself like audio, videos, audio, when you're exposed to the language, mm -hmm. like the input, yeah, is coming in that language. And some point you catch yourself that you are actually not like thinking, like directing that language, but you mm -hmm. start using some of the words and phrases because you're exposed. It's like when we were kids, we were exposed to our yeah. first uh, language. Same. So translation is okay when you're you discussing. You need to be exposed. You need to hear that. And mm -hmm. like um, then you need to read yeah, trans uh, not translation, but subtitles in the same language, especially like with French, right? Because it's like two different languages written and uh, spoken. Yeah. So you need yeah, to also like you need to help yourself with it. And then you need to learn to get read over the subtitle. That's that's kind of it's a jump. Okay. It's a but but uh, then uh, when you do it, it's great. Yeah, that's Anyways. actually the, the best the best exercise I ever did for myself when I was learning both Spanish and French is I would get an audio book and then I would get the actual book, the same book, yeah, and me too. The audio book yeah. all following along. And you yeah. I mean, just hundreds of thousands of words, yeah. just yeah, training your ear yeah. and eye at the same time. And there's no, no better yeah. exercise than that. You probably need to be at about a V1-ish to start really doing yeah. that. But but once you get to that point, then you really start accelerating. So I absolutely, love yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Well, coming back, yeah, talking yeah. about Avaling well, <laughs> great. So you can definitely yeah, go to our social media. We're like everywhere. Instagram, uh, TikTok, uh, well, Facebook, you know, Twitter, um, YouTube, of course, um, and there, uh, well, follow there, LinkedIn, of course, if you're professional, right? And then, yeah, you can find as well my books. Uh, one of the books, Language of Rigo, second edition, comes live in October. And then as well, the like, uh, Spanish book, Buenos Aires de Idiomas y Parqueros. Like, you can have a look at all and there. Just, yeah, like, uh, look up the articles, videos, and shoot us questions. So, whether you are learning a language on your own, whether you'd like to pick up culture, cultural intelligence, or if you're interested in specific courses, well, come to Malingua, come, come to Brainscape, and yeah, let's, well, let's learn together. I love it. Well, you've built such a great network of, of both human instruction and, and online resources, both from, from the, the ground up and for these different specializations. So congratulations on what you've done so far. I look forward to continuing to work together. Uh, and uh, everybody, I hope you've enjoyed this talk and uh, be sure to check out Amalingua and Brainscape for more greatness. I hope you got a ton of value from my conversation with linguist Ekaterina Matiba just now. Be sure to check out Amalingua for their foreign language and cultural intelligence and regional accent coaching, all of the details for which are in the show notes below. And of course, remember to keep using Brainscape's adaptive digital flashcards to help you study the vocab and the phrases and the conjugations of any language twice as efficiently as you are currently doing it. Remember, through a combination of good daily study habits, practice, and Brainscape's foreign language flashcards, you'll quickly rise to the challenge of learning any language.